Hello, I'm Eric Greenberg, Director of Museums for the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for your interest in Collective Perspectives, a series of presentations and discussions about the past and present significance of 18th century Newport furniture. We had originally planned to host these sessions on site here at the Whitehorn House Museum and at other locations in Newport, Rhode Island. But with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to rethink our plans and these sessions were hosted online over a four-day period in July of 2020. The conversations and presentations that emerged from these sessions were really wonderful. They were educational and they were entertaining, and it's a great pleasure for us to show you these presentations on our NRF YouTube channel. Before we begin, let me just make a few observations. First, because these sessions were handled remotely, sometimes the audio of our panelists can dip in and out a little bit, but I believe that on the whole, our panelists' audio feeds should be pretty clear and pretty audible. Another point is that at different times in our Q&A uh, and group panel discussions, you will see the image of a young woman on screen who rarely talks during the discussions. That's our manager of education and public programs, uh, Caitlin Seller, who fields the online questions during the discussion uh, session. Also, Caitlin's work in moving our public programming online has been invaluable this season. In fact, she's filming me as I speak. And finally, let me just observe that at the beginning of each of these videos, you'll see two short films. Uh, the first will be a funds appeal from our executive director, Mark Thompson. Uh, and the second will be a short movie about the Whitehorn House Museum. I hope you'll seriously consider Mark's appeal and possibly donate to the Newport Restoration Foundation. And I hope you find the information that we share really interesting. And that if you can, you'll come to Newport this summer and visit us at the White House Museum. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Thompson and I'm the Executive Director of the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this program today. Our founder, Doris Duke, was enamored with the 18th century. Evidence of her passion for restoring 18th century houses is all around us here in Newport. But she also had an avid interest in objects related to domestic life, and ultimately, she assembled a wonderful collection of 18th century furniture created here in Rhode Island and in Newport in particular. As you may know, Newport furniture represents some of the finest work of 18th century American decorative arts. And we are thrilled to be able to share our collection with you at Whitehorn House Museum. This program is part of an ongoing effort to tell the story of that furniture and of the people who created it and the people who acquired it. This program is generously supported by a grant from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. As you might imagine, the ongoing work of the Whitehorn House Museum relies upon the generosity of many individuals and organizations who share our passion for 18th century history and 18th century material culture. If this description fits you, we hope you'll consider donating to the Newport Restoration Foundation. And it's easy to do. Just visit our website at newportrestoration.org and click on the word support. Any amount you can afford to give will be genuinely appreciated. I hope you enjoy today's program and thank you. The Whitehorn House Museum takes a close look at the craftsmen and craftswomanship, artistry and industry of colonial Newport furniture. A piece of that story is the fabric surrounding furniture, as part of upholstery or displayed nearby as part of the arrangement of a domestic space. On the second floor of the museum, you will see examples of needlecraft on the walls of the rooms, carefully shown off and protected behind glass and within elegant gilded frames. Abigail Whitehorn was the sister of Samuel Whitehorn, the original owner of Whitehorn House. This sampler, completed by Abigail Whitehorn in 1804, allowed her to sew her way into the historical record. 
This example of needlepoint is representative of the work of many women and girls in the period who documented their lives, showed off their skill, and created artwork that often became a treasured heirloom passed from mother to daughter. Samplers like these were kept and displayed, and sometimes have found their way into archives and museum collections, where they are studied to gain a better understanding of domestic life, the role of girls in the household, and education practices of the time. So, let me uh, introduce uh, tonight's panelists. This final evening is particularly special, since I get to talk to members of my own team, um, as well as one of my favorite people in Newport. So I think I'll start my introduction with her. Ruth Taylor is a nonprofit and educational leader with over 30 years of experience. Currently, she's the executive director of the Newport Historical Society, a position that she's held for 13 years. And under her leadership, uh, the NHS has more than doubled its operating budget, established a highly successful living history program, and increased in-person visitation to NHS by a factor of 10. She holds a BA in anthropology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a Master of Science in Museum Leadership from the Bank Street School, something I didn't know about you, Ruth. We'll have to talk more about Bank Street at some point. And prior to her post at NHS, Ruth worked in a number of leadership positions, including a stint as the president of Newport's International Yacht Restoration School. Before that, Ruth got her start in museums, working at what was then the High Collection and what we now know as the National Museum of the American Indian. When I first met Ruth some 18 months ago, we noted that our lives had uh, intersected in two unexpected ways. We had both worked for the renowned uh, museum director, Rick West Jr., uh, at Ruth at the National Museum of the American Indian, myself at the Autry Museum of the American West in Los Angeles, and perhaps of the greatest significance, we were both students at PS81 in Riverdale, New York, the second time that Riverdale has come up in this series. And now I get to talk with her on a public panel. As I said, tonight's discussion is particularly special for me. Our next panelist is Kristen Costa. Kristen is NRF's curator and has been with the organization for 12 years. Over that time, she's curated numerous exhibitions and plays a central role, if not the primary role, in the care and preservation of our extensive and diverse collections. She holds a BA in American Studies from Franklin Pierce College and an MA in Public Humanities from Brown University. Prior to her tenure at NRF, Kristen held numerous curatorial and collections posts, including uh, at Newport's own International Tennis Hall of Fame and the Old Colony Historical Society in Taunton, Massachusetts. And last but surely not least is Gina Tangora. Gina is NRF's visitor experience and interpretation manager, and she played a pivotal role in the reopening of the Whitehorn House Museum, and her innovations in visitor experience have transformed the visitor experience at Rough Point as well, and in fact, if you have enjoyed the, the videos that we've shown you the past few nights, um, Gina produced, all, well, Caitlin produced the appeal and Gina produced the White House, uh, the Whitehorn mu Museum videos. Um, it, as I said to my staff, uh, several of my staff recently, did you ever think that you would become uh, segment producers um, when you started working in museums? Um, Gina holds an MPhil from Cambridge University in England she has an MS in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And prior to her work at NRF, uh, Gina's held several, positions, held several positions at the Richard Dryhouse Museum in Chicago. It's my great pleasure to welcome these three brilliant women to tonight's, tonight's discussion. I can honestly say that practically every day I learn something new from at least one of them. As I said, tonight is particularly special for me. It's really a pleasure. Welcome, ladies. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to begin with a question, but I'm also going to pull back the curtain and admit that I know there are slides that um, Gina and Kristen shared with me that I have not yet pulled up. And so I'm going to pull those up. And I think it's just better to be honest about that. Um, huh. I will find them. Um, so let's begin with the question, um, and we will, get, we will get those slides eventually. Um, in some sense, the entire, this entire series of programs um, was an attempt to answer one question, uh, which is why was or is Newport's 18th century furniture significant? Uh, but I think for the purposes of this conversation, I'm gonna ask the question a little differently. Uh, which is, why is the Newport furniture in your collection, that is to say, in NRF's collection or in 
uh, Newport Historical Society's collection. Why is it important to your work as museum professionals? Ruth, why don't you, why don't you start us off? Sure. I mean, I think it, to answer this question, you have to think about sort of what kind of museum you are, right? Newport Furniture straddles um, disciplines in a lot of ways, and it's in Art Museum. RISD Museum has um, Newport Furniture, and it's in um, history museums like ours as well, and it probably plays a different role depending on um, what your museum is trying to do. Um, for us, the fact that the furniture is um, exceedingly well made and exceedingly beautiful on the whole is almost a secondary category of its importance. Uh, we tend to um, focus on social and economic history and we're looking for the furniture in essence to be a component of a different kind of story. Um, and it's often surprising to me how much there isn't a lot of connect between the people who are looking at the furniture as decorative arts and the people who are looking at the furniture as material culture, if you will. Um, there isn't a whole lot of sharing between those two groups, even now, and it seems silly. Uh, uh, before I, I go to, to Kristen and Gina with this question, I was wondering if you can, I mean, so can you talk more a little bit about the, the what you've just said here, that there's, there's not as, you know, about the absence of um, connection between these sort of two fields between art and history? What would you like? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you said something and I think it's, it's interesting and it's important, but for the, let's put it this way. For those of us on this conversation, we're all museum people. I think we all understand what you're saying. There are many, many people on this uh, program tonight who are not. And so maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure, I mean, I think this has been a, a, not a dilemma only of Newport Furniture. I think, um, you know, people who got um, formal museum training 30 years ago, you know, old folks like me, um, <laughs> basically got trained as if we were all going to work for the Louvre, right? So right. everything is perfect and untouchable and everything is here because it's transcendently beautiful. And of course that's, um, that is one way to look at Newport Furniture, you know, goodness knows it is transcendently beautiful. But, um, you know, for me, the, the, the point is that Newport Furniture makers didn't just make these transcendently beautiful things, this subset of um, the work that they did. And so if you're looking at it from a uh, art or decorative arts perspective, you're going to miss the fact that they were also turning out uh, scroll rolls and coffins and um, other things that aren't in the Pantheon. And um, history museum is not an art museum. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to have a different perspective about its collection. We are actively looking for um, the non-furniture things that Newport furniture makers were making. You know, we're looking for scrolls. And um, man, I'd love to find a coffin. <laughs> <But> <laughs> In fact, <laughs> a couple of those raised crypts <laughs> behind the, the A market in Newport, you know, like to get a camera in there because I think, you know, this is a whole bigger part of the story that would not necessarily get told in the art museum. Although there is some um, blurring of that boundary in places like the RISD Museum where there is a broader perspective. I, I, mean, I, I recall um, years ago hearing Ivan Gaskell speak from Harvard who talked about that the field, the field of art museums in particular has created this false distinction between art and artifact, right? Mm -hmm. um, particularly, he was speaking particularly with respect to indigenous creations, um, but, but the, the, the idea can be applied more broadly. Um, so Kristen, thoughts on why, why these pieces are important to the work we do at NRF? What is, why do they matter? Well, I think um, Ruth certainly has put the, the idea of the sense of place and having these pieces of furniture, particularly at Whitehorn, you know, blocks away from where they're created. There's certainly a certain sort of um, excitement, I think, to that. Um, but for me, the, the thing about Whitehorn's collection and, and where 
even at NHS where the pieces are, is the ability to see things closely and mm. in the open. Um, when you go to so many art museums that have Newport pieces, um, you know, they're sort of up in their space. This is where they fit in the art history timeline and there's really not much else. And so for me as a curator, to be able to put pieces in a certain way to allow looking, to allow appreciation, but also learning because you can see things closely. Um, of course, there's always that worry that people are going to touch things too, but even um, educating people about that idea of touching or not touching, um, really opportunities that you don't get in a lot of larger art museums where they're really focusing just on um, the beautiful artistry. Right. Kristen, that implies that for you, um, part of the interest is in the making Absolutely. and in the ability to observe the details of the making and yes. not just in the sort of tableau of beauty. Exactly, yeah. Present. It's great right. to have shiny sheen and all that, but um, you know, when you take those drawers out and you see how fine a point on a dovetail joint, um, this might come up later when we talk about other things, but you know, you don't, no one has, very few people have furniture where you can actually see how it's made. Um, you know, you get things from Target and Ikea and um, right. it's just nice. Right. Gina, what about, what are your thoughts about um, why this is important? Why, why does this, why do these pieces matter to our work? Yeah, I would probably largely echo what- Gina, <laughs> you, can you speak a little louder? Oh. We're having a hard Hold time on. hearing you. Can you hear me now? Uh, no? No, oh, there you are. There you go. Okay, sorry. I just like that. Okay, try this again. Um, yeah, I think I would sort of echo what, what has already been said, certainly. Um, but we also, I think, when we were doing this rethinking, reinterpretation process, we wanted to think both on a, a really small level of thinking about the, these pieces that are made specifically in Newport and what that means, but then on this much bigger level too as well, how this furniture fits into these larger systems that we're starting to see created in this particular time period um, in the mid 18th century and how the furniture is a, is a, I guess, a, a lens to look through at these larger economic, political, social, cultural, even sometimes religious systems. So um, I'm giving a little broader answer, but I think that's why sure. any, anytime you look at uh, something that you're trying to interpret, I always, I always ask the question, so what, you know, why, why, why do we have this piece and why should I living in the year 2020 care about it? And why should people coming to see it care about it as well? Mm -hmm. Well, guys, Go ahead, Ruth. No, you guys have the additional story too of the collector of all this furniture and right. why, um, what, how that obsession came together and why it matters. And that is a, a plus, I think. It, it's mm. another story and an interesting one. I, I would argue also that, that, that eventually that opens the door to not just a single collector, but to the world of collectors, right? Which is mm -hmm. a comparatively new experience for me. Um, there is this um, subset of people for whom um, appreciating and acquiring these pieces matters a great deal. Several of them are on, uh, on in tonight's program, and I have found them to be you know, sort of fascinating people um, and who could be interested in this furniture for, for many, many different reasons. Um, but f returning to the museum perspective, which I think as, you know, as I said, it, it, it's worth noting, Ruth, that when um, I asked you that first question, someone actually said that they didn't quite get the answer. Because I do think that those of us who work in museums, after, you clar after we clarified the question, they started to understand, I assume. Uh, those of us we who assume. work in museums, we assume. <laughs> I mean, maybe they'll respond again. Um, that, um, you know, that for those of us who work in museums, objects just have this very different meaning. Objects exist as an object in and of themselves, but they are also storytellers, right? Um, which I think is incredibly important, which raises a question I would like to ask. And let's start with Gina this time, which is, and I know this because Gina and I talk every week, um, and one of the things we talk about is Whitehorn House. Um, you know, are there specific stories um, about Newport furniture that you're particularly interested in, that you want people to know about? Um, hmm. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, particular stories. So I think what's really interesting, um, something that we've been trying to do is we can appreciate the artistry of a piece of furniture, but we also are looking at it 
almost as a, as a historical document that can tell us a lot about not just the maker of the piece, but um, even drilling down to where the material is coming from. Um, they're part of this, this triangle trade system, systems actually. Um, and all the people involved in that from enslaved persons to merchants and then all the way up to the, the maker of the piece and all the hands that touched the piece before it was made and then to the consumer itself and how the piece is used and appreciated and how it ended up in our collection today. So I think thinking about it that way is having all these visible and invisible layers that we can unpack, I think is um, really interesting. And that's a, that's a very, yeah, oh, somebody else can talk now. <laughs> well, I mean, Ruth, um, I keep going back to that casket that you're looking for. What, um, uh, you know, what story are you hoping to tell with such a find? I mean, um, what would it do for us? Well, I'm curious, of course, because um, we know from their account books that these guys were churning out things like caskets, mm -hmm. you know, that a, a piece like the one behind you right there was not a, um, you know, you, you didn't go from one of those to another. Now, obviously, it's apprentices and um, other people in the workshop who are churning mm -hmm. out coffins, maybe most of the time, because um, I don't know of one that survived. And if actually anyone who's participating does know, um, uh, do please call me. <laughs> um, we don't actually know what kind of care and artistry might have been taken with something in mm. which you buried the dead. And we know certainly from the stone carvers and the gravestones and the common burying ground that a great deal of care was taken with those and some artistry as well. Um, and that's a story I'd love to be able to tell. Mm. Yeah. Kristen, um, what are your thoughts on the stories? I, you know, we've, I've worked with you and Gina for about 18 months now. And I, I, when I came to NRF, you were, the two of you were developing uh, what we sometimes call the exhibit script for, for the museum. Um, so, you know, what stories, I, I have a sense of what stories you wanted to tell uh, at the time. Are there other stories, stories that we haven't quite gotten to yet? What are you, what are you interested in selling with this exceptional collection? I think for um, me and, and a lot of folks who are digging more into Rhode Island furniture is really just the a massive amount of creative sort of synergy, for lack of a better word, that was happening. You have a neighborhood, you know, just a few blocks where you, a lot of furniture is coming out of, but also a lot of sort of innovation. And then you also have uh, this whole shop system. So we've got, you know, sort of the guys in charge, the famous names that we know, but everyone who worked under them. And now we're learning that these gentlemen um, went to other spaces, places, and created furniture inspired by the Newport style, but with their own twist. And um, so now Warren, Rhode Island, East Greenwich, and Westerly. And so really the fact that this one sort of spot of inspiration um, really inspired the rest of sort of the creativity that was coming out of Rhode Island. And, and now that's other areas to sort of go and mine, um, you know, and, and again, bring it back to this sense of place that there, there are these um, other possible furniture centers that are, are we never knew about before. I think it's really exciting. Because we were so focused on Newport, right? Exactly. I mean, I, I don't think you can get away. I mean, for me, this might not be a primary story, but I don't think you can get away from the fact that the fascination with Newport um, furniture was in a sort of self-feeding cycle with the value mm -hmm. of Newport furniture. Mm -hmm. You know, when you could have a peer table in your grandmother's house that was worth $2 million. This causes some deep fascination. Sure. And I think that's an interesting story that we don't always tell either. I mean, it's a little bit like the, you know, the tulip craze where right. these things right. became so intensely valuable <clears throat> that that in itself was fascinating. Yeah, even in, in, when, in Brock's, Brock Job's discussion on, um, on Wednesday, um, when they showed some of the bills of sale, which may very well have come from your collection, Ruth, for all I know, um, the cost of the furniture, it was, I mean, it was surprisingly expensive for the, you know, expensive. Mm -hmm. I was really quite, quite blown away. Um, it's quite extraordinary. Um, I want to actually move back to the sort of the other side of 
of thinking about objects, which is instead of thinking about object as storyteller, in some sense, thinking about object as object. One of the things that Gina has said uh, on, on numerous occasions that I think matters a great deal is that one of the things that we have going for us as a museum of furniture is that people get furniture, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, Jonathan Brower said it last night, a chair is a chair. Um, it may be a different kind of chair. It may be a different height chair. It's a chair. Pe many, many cultures understand chairs. Um, and so I guess for all of you, and maybe we'll start with Kristen this time, um, is there a sense, um, do you think that, um, that our visitors make that connection because it's furniture? I mean, I, I would actually say that it's very clear to me that they make that connection to our museums because our museums are housed yes. in houses. Mm -hmm. um, that, that comes across right away. Certainly at Rough Point, we hear it all the yeah. time. But the objects themselves, um, you know, Gina has made that case to me, um, and I think others have as well. Um, what is your sense about that? Is it so, and, and, and how do we see it? And are there other things we can do um, to make that clear? Kristen, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think people get that it's furniture. You know, they don't wonder about, oh, how is that made? You know, they have a general <laughs> sense, like they understand chairs go into the bottom of, you know, a, a, a chair seat <laughs> and so forth. But I think for um, people don't see, because we don't have m many objects in our lives anymore that we value in a long-term sense that we're gonna pass down to our kids. Um, that it's, I think sometimes hard for people to understand that these things have survived generations that many of the pieces in our house at Whitehorn House um, and in the collection did pass down through families and that these are things that you know, were meant to survive. I think that is hard for people to still sort of understand, but also amazes them that, that this chair that mm. people generation sat on or the sideboard that was used every Thanksgiving still looks amazing and survived. Mm -hmm. That I think for people is where some of the wow comes in um, to think that, you know, what is this chair scene and, and that kind of with the mm -hmm. walls could talk kind of thing. Um, but of course, I think the, the, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was, the other part of that is that it's sort of, um, I think still a little bit of a dividing line for people because it, uh, it sort of imposes a bit of elitism that these things did survive because they were only used once a year because they're not in houses where people are sitting on the chairs every day or had hard, you know, sort of days or that these were elevated pieces. So um, it does still, I think, still feel like the other um, because it is a little bit more high class than what people, um, would think for themselves in their everyday lives. But of course, most of the Newport furniture shops were also making utilitarian right. furniture. Right, and of course, we don't use. have a lot of that we in our some, Whitehorn collection. Yeah. Um, and those are the things that now we're like, oh, we want that vernacular yeah. everyday mm -hmm. pieces. Right. We want to see those dinged up chests that have, you know, years of babies sleeping in them and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and if that. And that's a part, I think that's probably a later question about how sort of the field and, and collecting and all that right. has changed too. Right. And how is it, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the things that survive often do survive because of some Their sense value. of privilege. Yeah, because, yeah. And, and, or even if they're not incredibly valuable, the, the families that, they, that, were own, that owned them were able to keep them because they didn't need to sell them. Or mm -hmm. in the instance I worked, I once worked on an exhibit um, that we thought we might do about an African-American family in Kansas. And we found that the material culture was just, not there, not because it didn't exist at one time, but because when you were done with a plow and it broke, you turned it into firewood. You didn't hold on to a broken right. plow so that everyone could remember, right? So there is a certain level of privilege. Um, but Gina, since I, I, I kind of put you on the spot because I, <laughs> I guess I'm in the habit of doing so, forgive me. But, um, you know, do you see this connection? Are there things that you hope to do to yeah. expand this connection? What, you know, what is your thinking on this? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with everything that Kristen has said as well. But um, I think too that, um, you know, in the Western world, we do have this lived experience that most of us, I mean, I'm sitting on something right now. I'm assuming most of you are not sitting on the floor. So we, we have this experience, you know, really intimate experience with the furniture in our lives that we use every day at work, at home. Um, and uh, we certainly, tend to throw away things more or maybe um, 
now just the way the consumer culture goes, we uh, things tend to go out of style faster, I think, too, in a way that they didn't before. But I still think there's something, um, yeah, really intimate and maybe even sentimental about furniture and the placement of furniture in a household. You think about when you're sitting at a table with your family, you know, we tend to sit in the same spots. Um, I think even in, even in a classroom, you tend to sit in the same spot. So you have this personal connection to the space in the room with, um, with, with seating in particular. So you think about, uh, I guess in my own experience, I have furniture that I think about that my, you know, my grandparents used and, and just that pers really personal connection I have to that. Um, so I think for me that it, it does come down to making sure we get, you know, people back into the story of the objects um, because they were designed for people and they're beautiful works of art, but they also have this really important utility and, and use in most cases. They weren't yet, just decorative. Right, and yet, well, but most of these pieces were not actually decorative at the time. I mean, they were, Compared it to, was a desk, mm -hmm. it was a desk. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, they, the things in our collection have been removed from right. their utility. Context. And I, mm -hmm. And I actually think, obviously, for many collectors, although probably not all, and by the way, if someone on this <laughs> call is a collector who actually uses their Newport desk as a desk, I salute you. Um, I think most of our collectors are treating them almost like museum objects. Too. Sure. They're not using them. And there is an intimate relationship, as you said, Gina, that we have with the furniture we use as furniture. Yeah. And that connection has to some degree been lost and recreating yeah. it in a museum context is not always easy. No. Right. Yeah, because I, yeah. yeah, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt. Please. I wonder if it, it is, <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it is um, in our particular space because we are uh, literally in a house um, and we don't interpret the rooms as period rooms. Um, we have some cases where, especially upstairs, where we have kind of more of a, a domestic bedroom scene. But in most cases, we're, we're um, allowing you to get close to the objects and they're placed in the room just as a, as a way for you to get close to them, as Kristen said, and, and to appreciate them. Um, but they're still in the context of this domestic space. So I'm sort of curious about that, too. I, I guess we'd have to ask visitors that if that sort of impacts um, this, their, how, how, they're be, how they're interpreting the pieces and what they feel about them. Um, I, guess, I guess one of the challenges, of course, is that um, we have certain standards about how we treat collections, um, certain field-wide yeah. standards, ethical standards, because I really want to sit in a corner chair. I have no idea what it feels like to sit in one of those. I know. <laughs> Apparently Ruth does. I, I don't. I really would it's like to. It's actually remarkably comfortable. comfortable. I, really? I, so, those of you who know me know that my husband collects um, beat up vernacular Newport chairs and mm. he gets them for very little most of them are now too so short to be or Rhode <laughs> Island chairs in general but Newport whenever you can Sorry. find them most of them have had their legs cut off um, a little bit so they're kind of too short for a dining room table but he did he did get a corner chair at one point and I have sat in and mm. it is enormously comfortable but I have to tell you a fast story if you'll indulge me please about this very thing um, when I was relatively new at the Historical Society, we were contacted by a descendant of William Ellery, and um, an elderly man, and he had, um, by his fire right now, um, an upholstered armchair that William Ellery had made for his daughter, Almy, when she got married, and um, made by Newport Furniture Makers, and upholstered with a fabric that his wife, embroidered mm -hmm. um, and every hundred years the family had cut the cruel work off the worn ground mm -hmm. and sewed it onto new fabric and reupholstered wow. the chair so that was twice I think um, and he thought you know his kids didn't want it and it ought to come home to Newport and would I like to have it so I, 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 I said yes um, and so we had it in our um, headquarters building newly there and I called then still living Ralph Carpenter and said, you, you, you probably want to come see this. And um, he came over. I said, it came right from the fire, you know, from the fireside <laughs> to, to here. And he came over and the very first thing he did was plop himself down. <laughs> <laughs> and I had that museum lady moment of like, yeah. <gasps> oh, no. and I thought the gentleman who gave it to us was sitting in it last week. Right. 
Right. And this was Ralph's way of knowing the chair. He said, mm -hmm. very nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I mean, from... uh, I was going to Go say ahead. that's something that's something that we've also been um, really interested in, too, because, yeah, that we obviously, unfortunately, cannot let you use the furniture, but um, that just the whole experience of sit sitting and the, and the pleasure of seating and comfort and all that, it, you know, it, it forces a certain posture or slouching or whatever. I, I, I find that super fascinating. So oh. we do have some examples where you can sit um, on some repro Windsor chairs, um, which again is not the same as a, as a, as a um, roundabout chair or something like that, that is uh, some more, um, an easy chair. But I, yeah, I think that's really important um, in our work as well to pe give people that experience because it's it's not just being able to look at something or smell something or, or hear about it, being able to, to the materiality of it, I think. Right, to right. tell if a rush seat is less right. comfortable than With, an upholstered exactly. seat. It's making me wonder if we don't need to bring some of these Taylor family chairs down to Newport and, <laughs> and let a whole bunch of people we take sit it. in them. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a partnership we can work on for yes, next year. We indeed, can sort of think indeed. about that. If... S sitting day. But, um... Right. Oh, I love <laughs> yeah. it already. There we go. Yes. You heard it here, folks. Sitting day <laughs> next week, next year. If the world is allowed to congregate in 2021, That's true. we will give it a shot. Um, a lot of this discussion has uh, circled around a concept that we, we haven't named yet, but it comes up all the time in museum work. Um, which is um, relevance, right? Which is to say that a 21st century, now I, I, as a historian, I have my own sort of opinions about this. I think we, there's a benefit in discovering the past simply as undiscovered country and it need not apply to my life to be important. But mm -hmm. this is a, as a museum professional, I understand full well that we are um, often desperately looking to make connections between the lived experience of our 21st century visitors and whatever moment of the past we're thinking about. And um, with that in mind, I mean, Gina, what are the, you know, the things, the, the stories that you're hoping to tell to, to create that relevance at a place like Whitehorn House? And, and before you answer, I do have the PowerPoint. If you want to show any images, just let me know and I can pull them up. Oh, okay. Um... Yeah, maybe after this. I don't know. Maybe in the questions, Kristen, we want. To, I don't know when you want to look at the images. Whenever they're here, we can okay. pull them up at any time. You, you know, it's it's not right. a problem. Um, so relevance, yes. Um, I think that part of that has been trying to make a connection to um, what uh, the experience and everybody's experience obviously is not exactly the same, but um, an experience in the year 2020 living in the United States of America, um, being able to trace uh, institutions and systems back to this, this moment in history. And um, I think that that's important that we can, that we're telling the story of um, early America and early Newport and the founding, all, all that through the furniture and the material culture and um, being able to, to that's, that's a pun. I was going to say weave the thread all the way through <laughs> to, to, your, to your experience today. And whether, again, that, that has to do with um, um, like social systems, um, so political institutions, culturally, things. And I think that it helps to be able to look at how people lived in the past or thought in the past or worked in the past and lived in the past and how that, that connects to what your experience is like now and how it's different. And I think that's, that's where some, where the relevance comes in. Um, and that's, again, a really broad answer, but I oh, think- Sure, and, that, and so too, I'm actually yeah, gonna ask you to articulate- Specifically, yeah. To more specifically, so, so right. So the idea is that somehow the, the experiences of people in the past somehow relate to the 21st century. Um, can you think of a specific example where we might talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess part of the conversation that we just had about, you, you know, your, your lived experience living with furniture, um, how that is the same or how that, that might be different to your life today. So mm -hmm. wants to interrupt me, <laughs> that's fine. Um, no, I don't want to interrupt you, no, I no, just no, want to add. <laughs> add. Yeah, um, and I think, if we think about, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I guess I'm, I'm thinking too broad again, but we, we're looking at um, the furniture is coming from a specific 
let's say in this case, economic system that was okay. created um, out of the particular, the, uh, this culture and that were making more, that was making more, um, sorry, there's a class of people who started making more money and that they're able to afford this type of furniture and that creates this, this um, chain reaction where we now have a, a, a market for this furniture and it comes into their homes and then it's, you know, that's something that's desired and more people want it and then it stays as uh, something that someone later on sees as, as a, a collector's item that needs to be preserved in that way and it ends up in a museum and we go look at it. But I think at that point, um, what we're relating to is that that we, uh, I think a lot of us are aspirational and we have things in our, in our houses that we feel like reflect our, our <laughs> how we see ourselves, our, our status, our, um, right. our taste, right. and that it's, you know, it's a, it's a different system, but it, it's part of that same cycle. Right. I mean, this, this is one of sort of my great interests is consumerism, right? Mm -hmm. the, the 18th century consumerism and 21st century consumerism. I, I, that feels very much what you've been describing here, Gina, is that they don't, when you start to think about it, they don't feel that different, right? Mm -hmm. The peoples of the 18th century um, may very well have had the same desire to keep up with the Joneses mm -hmm. um, as others. Um, but Ruth, you wanted, uh, you wanted to say something? Yeah, two things now. Um, and one is, yes, uh, you know, the um, 18th century consumer revolution has a lot of parallels today. And it's also a very relatable phenomenon to talk about. I mean, for example, in the very early 18th century, when people did start to accumulate a little wealth, and started to accumulate um, some goods, you, um, you have people buying locks all of a sudden. Everybody's buying <laughs> locks <laughs> um, because um, I'm assuming either their fear or the reality is that people are gonna pilfer the things that they worked so hard to get. But I was gonna say another thing that I think is relevant, um, again, if we move away a little bit from the highest expression of this, our subject matter, is that there was a real um, gig economy in the 18th century. You know, there were people working jobs around the margins, just making a go of it. And when we tease those stories out of the records, you know, they were making nails for the furniture makers mm -hmm. or sharpening tools. Um, they were probably digging graves, um, my obsession. But, um, <laughs> But, but, but they, they exist in the record too. And when we start to tease that out, you're looking at people who are maybe more resilient than we know because these things are essential and survive some of the ups and downs um, that are more complicated for the um, higher end mm. uh, merchants and craftsmen. Kristen, do you have any thoughts about this? About particular, for lack of a better term, relevances or connections, say, between 18th and 21st century peoples and how, you know, how, how our objects tell us something about that. Well, I think in general, you know, a lot of looking at the past always feels like the other, like, oh, those people back then. Um, and it's hard to feel that connection and relevance. So for us, you know, bringing it back as Jane said, furniture's all around you. Um, but thinking about the choices you make in your everyday sort of decisions about how you set your house up and um, you know, some of the better conversations that I've heard at Whitehorn are more like, well, why would I get a table like that? I can't, you couldn't sit at that kind of a table or who would need a dressing table and a tea table, you know? And so asking about the use and utilitarianism of these pieces and what they're used for then versus now, um, you know, the conversations that happen around those kinds of things, I find more interesting um, sometimes then, you know, saying like, oh, well, the slipper foot angle and, or right. whatever, um, sure. because people are saying like, that would never fit in today or something. And that, that's just very interesting to me, the angle that people go with, because, you know, as, as museum professionals, um, you know, we want to educate and engage and enlighten and all these things, but it's also, it's kind of entertainment too. And right. um, just to have that conversation as silly as it might sound sometimes, is still engaging in the material. Mm -hmm. Um, right. and, um, and so, yes, uh, sometimes I'm, I, I want people to get the history and to feel, you know, <laughs> to learn and to understand, but 
if they're just talking about it and whether it fit in their front parlor or not, I'm mm -hmm. happy because they actually are engaging in something. Sure. Uh, Nina Simon referred to those as um, social objects, right? Yes. Objects that yeah. generate, that you'll sit in front of for more than 30 seconds and that you're willing to talk about. And um, sure, that is absolutely one of the functions of museums. And, and I think you're educating people then too, right? Because they will now know that there was such a dining room table, that slipper mm -hmm. feet are a thing. And I think, to me, actually, Newport Furniture's feet are one of the closest approximations to 21st century consumerism. There's nothing beneficial about, there's nothing more beneficial about them than any other sort of way that a table gets a floor. Mm -hmm. they're, they're about style and about choices that people make related to style. Um, so I love hearing those yeah. conversations. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, yeah, I'm sorry. Go I was going to say, I was going to say too, Kristen, that, yeah, I don't know. I don't think that's silly. I think that's that this kind of push and pull that people have, because I think we're all a little um, ego or a lot egocentric. So we're always, I feel like anytime somebody's in that space and you're, you're learning about the past, you're always comparing it to, to your, your experience. Is that, is that something I, I can identify with, or is that seems so different from my experience? But I think in that space, that's where you have a lot of, you have their, have, you have their attention and that's where other things can happen. Like, like empathy and um, mm -hmm. an interest in, in moving beyond just looking at, at a piece and what comes next. It right. makes me want to learn more and, or do something about it. And our friend, our, uh, many of our mutual friend, Ken Torino, mm -hmm. pointed out that, um, that at Whitehorn, we also think about, you know, we, the, the 18th century often seems like this bifurcated society. Monolithic. And in fact, it was, uh, you know, the workshops were diverse. We know there were enslaved people. We know that people came from, from many places. And mm -hmm. um, he complimented us on thinking about that and looking at that. <laughs> um, so, um, and I, that's coming from Ken that I really appreciate that. Um, we are really into the hour. And so I want to ask one more question before we uh, open this up to our visitors, to our audience. Um, it's a question I asked last night. Oh, no, I asked it, um, uh, maybe I've asked it several nights, um, which is um, if you were building a brand new museum of Newport furniture um, and money and space were simply not an object, you, the, the world was your oyster, you could do whatever you wanted, what are the things you would want to see in such a place? Because the truth is that all that, whether it's Ruth's, you know, whether it's um, the, Ruth's place up on Turo or the Whitehorn House Museum, we have space limitations. Our budgets are our budgets. Um, we build the best museums that we can build given the museum's limitations. That's true of everywhere. That's, you know, the, the Boston MFA is no different in that regard. Um, but if suddenly, um, the skies opened up and the bucket of money fell down and you could do whatever you wanted and, um, and we could um, create the biggest museum on the planet. What would that museum look like? What are the things that you would do in it? Um, and Gina, as our um, uh, manager of interpretation, I'm going to start, and visitor engagement, I'm going to start with you. Uh, keeping in mind that this is very much a pitch for this for the 2021 budget sure right. <laughs> <laughs> that's great um yeah i i think that um we talked about this a little bit earlier that there are still we're i think we're doing we've at least started on the right path of being able to tell a, a broader um, more honest inclusive story about what um, went into the furniture making process and who made the furniture and who purchased the furniture and all those related stories. But I think we we have more that we want to do with that as well. Um, to, in particular, as we mentioned earlier, talking about other people, like um, enslaved persons, free people of color, indigenous people, women, et cetera, et cetera, who typically, um, um, there's not as much research and materiality involved with them right now. And, they, and yeah, we've, we've started that work, but we need to continue. Um, and then I think, too, we're interested in expanding uh, the collection as well, because we do have some really fine exceptional pieces, but that's just a small, really small portion of what was actually being produced at the time. Um, and thinking about export furniture, meaning furniture that was made in Newport, but was meant to go elsewhere in the transatlantic world, which I think is super interesting as well to think about the continuation of taste all the way down the coast and even 
further south into the West Indies. Um, and just other vernacular pieces too, that I think, uh, as Kristen said earlier, we do have we do have some Windsor chairs and some other banister back chairs with brush bottoms, but I think it would be really interesting to um, be able to expand that part of our collection as well so we can tell stories of um, people with different backgrounds and just mm -hmm. those of the elite. All right, since we're putting this budget proposal together, uh, let's let's keep it in-house for a minute and uh, then we'll go to Ruth. But Kristen, what are what are your thoughts? The 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 Newport Center of Furniture, uh, bigger than Yale Study Center, um, everything you want. What's what's in that place? But it's you know it's an encyclopedia of Newport makers, uh, known and unknown. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's uh, you know all the sort of things that we read about. That you know this random person who made something in Warren, Rhode Island. Um, but it's also um, having the ability to show how things are made and put together in a right. better way. You know, now, you know, we can pull out a drawer every now and again, mm -hmm. or um, we have these amazing pieces that um, Jeffrey Green has made for us so we can show visitors how mm -hmm. a, a ball and claw is made and people can handle it and feel what mahogany feels like. Um, but it's, you know, having a blown up, blown out, you know, secretary desk where you see how the parts all fit together. Um, having mirrors behind things so you can see, you know, um, the graphite marks, um, mm -hmm. having an infrared camera so that people can look to see those little things that you can't see with the naked eye. Um, and, you know, the uh, microscope, you can see the wood and the differences between mahogany or Spanish cedar. I mean, we're getting kind mm -hmm. of like really into the super mm -hmm. duper m money here, but <laughs> um, I think it, what becomes exciting about Newport Furniture is that it's not just base level pretty, that, that there, there's just all these layers and to be able to show that everything from the stories of the people to how it's made um, would, would just be spectacular. I'd go yeah. there. And right. I don't like going to museums anymore. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I would like to see, uh, I, we could have a working furniture workshop as well. That would be Yeah, that'd be great too. Uh, yeah. And it's worth noting that our executive director and two board members are on this uh, oh, call. So gentlemen, there is our budget. <laughs> Uh, Ruth, what are your thoughts about this? Because you'll be collaborating with us. We're going to build this museum together. Right. I, I, so, I, so I was going to accuse you of, you know, getting no, no, your you homework are, for you. We're but... doing this together. We're doing <laughs> this together. So um, I think you could tell a great deal of the story of 18th century life in Newport through the Furniture Museum mm -hmm. with biographies and the economics. How many hours did it take to build a chest on chest? And where did the materials come from in the world? You, it would be so easy to blow up the uh, story in almost any direction. And I do think the biographies are intensely interesting to people and also mm -hmm. give you an opportunity to pull threads. And my, I think, biggest um, interest in this, and, and some of you know that I've been thinking about the Center for Newport Furniture for a long time since Ralph Carpenter was alive and asked me to think about it. Um, I would like to see the account books integrated right. with the objects Absolutely. and accessible for people to look at both for research and for mm -hmm. that entertainment and kind of wow factor. And, right. and we do have in our collection um, some vernacular furniture and some pieces that were made for export to the South. So we, we could bring that to the table, but we also have the ledger books and that is, mm -hmm. I think, the biggest thing. Right. that we would bring to the collaboration. Well, I, I also think uh, it's because <clears throat> this is what museum people do. Uh, our friend Ken Torino has also um, given us another, there's going to be another wing to the museum, which will be <laughs> contemporary makers on the Quidnick Island, which oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very, very interested in as mm -hmm. well. I mean, we had two contemporary makers on last night and the night before um, Steve Brown is a contemporary maker, although not a Newport maker. Um, you know, there's, there's just this really sort of interesting legacy on the Quidnick mm -hmm. Island. Of these well, and people are tremendously interested in watching people mm -hmm. work. Yes. I mean, whatever the motivations are. I mean, look at the Iris observation deck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, I worked for them and I'll still go in there periodically. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, um, as I said, we are deep into the hour. It's almost seven o'clock and I would like to create an opportunity for um, our audience to ask questions. So Caitlin, you've been sort of monitoring the feeds. Um, I noticed, uh, by the way, that my one of my former colleagues from Los Angeles has asked 
many questions. Um, and I'm, you know, so we'll, we'll try and answer uh, some of those as well. Um, but go ahead, what are, what are we being asked? Um, yeah, we've, had, we've actually had a lot of questions come in during the discussion, which is amazing. Um, so we'll start with, um, with a question that came in early on uh, from Sarah Wilson, who is that your, yeah, yes. there we go. Um, who asked early on if when um, you, know, you were putting together Whitehorn House, um, if you, when you were reinterpreting, if you had a particular audience in mind when you were developing the displays, mm -hmm. You know, putting together the interpretation. You know what? While you're talking about that, let me go ahead and share the screen, and I'll bring up. Um... Yeah, it's funny you asked that because I was thinking we did, that actually didn't come up. That's that was what I was thinking about beforehand. Is that um, you know, Kristen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I always think of it as as we were thinking about um, probably two distinct audiences, um, where we have the um, people who are already big fans of furniture in this period and and know a lot about it and are connoisseurs, and then. Um, we had a more general audience that perhaps just have a general interest in history or maybe even a historic house. Sometimes they walk in the museum because we're in a house and they think we're a house museum. Um, or, yeah, and so those are those are really two different audiences. And I think that's what made it was quite quite the challenge to be able to meet the needs of both those audiences um, in the same space. The um, in the early days when we first started talking about redoing Whitehorn back, I think when I started in 2008, just we had so many conversations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there were some, some more statistical sort of analyses happening with surveying and things. But this slide that, Ken, um, that um, Eric just brought up right here, um, this is the, if no one has been to Whitehorn or has not been in a while, this is how it used to look where we had sort of the period rooms and there was lots of stuff to look at yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when you see on the right, that's our John Townsend dining table with a beautiful label and it's an amazing piece of furniture. And you couldn't even see it because it was covered with Chinese export porcelain and reproduction glassware. Um, so just see, um, if you can go to the fourth slide, Eric. Okay, so we basically <laughs> put pair down. I, I'm, I'm frozen, so yeah, I can't, I can't, see I can't do anything. Um, but, uh, okay, here we go. So by just by paring down the, um, the rooms to, to look at the furniture, take away the extra stuff, um, in the interpretation, we were just thinking people need to see things. Um, Caitlin, other questions? Um, so another, um, uh, question that, that came in, in relation to interpretation, um, we've got some questions about, um, how deeply the interpretation at Whitehorn goes into issues of class and um, you know socioeconomic issues. Um, and I, if, if you don't mind, Caitlin, I'd also like to extend that to um, the way NHS um, sort of addresses their furniture collection with respect to race and class. Mm -hmm. Gina, do you want? To? Uh, okay, sure. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, in our orientation space, um, we sort of frame what, what was going on in uh, Colonial Newport that sort of set the conditions for this furniture to be made and produced, made and sold and consumed. And um, we talk about right away the fact that this was, uh, we, New, Newport was part of the um, a triangle trade system and that involved enslaved persons. And we also talk about, um, uh, sorry, I just lost my whole train of thought. Um, we also are talking about uh, women and the role they played, not just as consumers and arbitrators of taste, but also that they were makers, um, particularly when it came to upholstered or needlepoint seat covers. Um, and we talk about that there's different layers of furniture, or levels of um, sorry, layers of furniture that we're looking at too from the everyday vernacular Windsor chair, for example, to something like a very fine high chest. So we do pretty explicitly address gender, race, status, socioeconomic status, I think. Yeah, I, hope. I, I think we do. Um, Ruth, do you have any thoughts about? Yeah, um, I, I think the, the really complicated um, issue about talking about 
class in the 18th century with a modern day audiences, our notions of class are not always um, or are mm. not directly applicable to the past. And in fact, some of the ideas that people have about class and gentry um, mm. are even uh, regionally not appropriate, you know, um, um, and, and, and the sort of flattening of the timeline, right? People think about class in the past and they think about the plantation south or, you know, in New England, um, ideas about class and status were really evolving in the 18th century. And you see that a lot during the um, occupation of Newport by the British, where British come in with their very European notion of landed gentry and born mm -hmm. to class. And Newport citizens are a little more basing their status on how much money they have in their pocket and there are clashes based on this. So I am cautious about talking about class um, with the public because it's um, easy to invoke um, ideas that are not accurate. Um, but um, obviously we try to tell always a whole history that includes mm. poor people and rich people and people mm. of color and right. people of enslaved status or not. Mm. Um, we're particularly interested in telling stories about people who moved from slavery to freedom and how they did it because that's an unexpected story. Um, right. Your comments, Ruth, remind me, a, a former mentor of mine once said that um, his students often think about the peoples of the past as identical to the peoples of the present, but with less good technology, right? Um, <laughs> but, um, but still, it's not uh, unreasonable to say that, right, those are the, the, what we think of as the middle class today would not have been a, a, a phenomenon at a certain point in time. But there is, sorts. this is a... Right, exactly. This is the, but it becomes of the a phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. later. So you kind of see the foundations for it. Yeah. yeah, and I'd have to, I guess I'd have to clarify and say we don't, I, we don't use the word class, but yeah, right. we, <laughs> we talk about, yeah, different, um, yeah, status. Yeah, yeah, different levels of status in society. Yeah, and your because, wealth, wealth right. and power and prestige and all those right. things that we still have today. Well, you know, because this is the moment where it's beginning to, it's not even codified yet. It's no. developed. So, yeah. Developing. Um, Caitlin, other questions? Yes. Um, so Ken also asked an interesting question um, that I think I know the answer to. Um, if does NRF own any of the houses or workshops of the town, <laughs> um, or you know potentially other uh, Newport furniture makers? Kristen, you've been here the oh. longest. Oh, we do not. Anymore, as of no. as of yeah. that's what I was going to say. What an <laughs> interesting question. Yeah. yeah. Um, what an interesting question. NRF um, has done a lot of, uh, you know, work research um, of those spaces. Some of them mm -hmm. don't exist anymore, um, yeah. and or have been moved and significantly altered. Um, up until a, a, a week or two ago, we owned um, the Christopher Townsend House, um, which had a shop attached to it, which turned mm -hmm. out after many years of research was in fact not the shop. Um, um, and the house had had some alterations over the years. So, what about this? Isn't there like the Solomon Townsend or something? What am I talking about? I feel sure. like there's another. Yeah, there's, sorry. We own many I, homes, there's a so couple. I've sort of lost yeah, I know. names. I know, yes. but yeah, but Krista, you know, yeah, Kristen's point about the workshop is absolutely correct. We don't have a workshop in the collection. Right, we don't. But we do own a great many houses. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Um, Caitlin, do you want to ask the next question? Yes, um, this I thought was an interesting question um, for everyone. There, um, Larry uh, is very interested. Larry's joined us for many of these evenings, so it feels like a very familiar name now. It's very nice to see your name again. Um, Larry is is um, is uh, very you know pleased to be joining all of these presentations um, and is wondering if there's going to be more like this um, and sort of like virtual tours and um, programs of you know, the various museums since we can't always, you know, visit so easily in these times. Well, I'm going to take that one then. Um, it's just something that I, certainly Caitlin, you and I have been talking about at great length, which is that um, it seems that it will be impossible to go back to simply uh, in-person programs that once we, that, that we will of course do in-person programs once it's safe to do so. But now that we've begun to do this work 
online as well. I think we're going to just have, we, we will continue to do this because as I've said on uh, several nights, we've been able to um, have people here from Ohio, from Virginia, from North Carolina, you know, Ken's up in Boston. I don't think he was going to drive down for this tonight. Um, you know, so we, it, it gives us an opportunity to reach a broader community of people who really, really are, are, are interested in these topics um, and, and in topics related to Red Point and in topics related to Prescott Farm. Um, Ruth, um, what are you, what's going to happen at NHS when, when the world starts congregating again? Will you move away from online programming or will you, will you stay involved in it? No, I, I, I mean, we're embarking on a sort of planning process to answer those kinds of questions, but it seems really obvious to me that um, digital components of the work will always be <laughs> important. Even something as tangible and in-person as the Newport show, hmm. um, you know, it's going to be all virtual this year. My suspicion is next year it will start in person and continue virtually. Hmm. You're just able to reach so many more people. Right. And, you know, Newport does hold a tremendous fascination for people all around the world. And we ought not to be leaving them out of the, the game. Yeah. And I would just point out that um, uh, I have everybody's email. Uh, you will in all likelihood get a survey from me. And it will be trying to understand the kinds of programs that you would be interested in participating in online, mm -hmm. as well as in person. Mm -hmm. um, this is definitely something that, um, that I think moving forward will be, uh, it won't be the only way in which we reach people, um, but it's going to become a regular part of our repertoire. I was going to say too, it's interesting because we started a little bit of a digital component, even physically on site last year, where we had a kiosk where people could um, look at angles and images of the objects that they couldn't with the naked eye, like Kristen mm. was saying. And then also we had short maker videos because we know that that's, that's something right now we can't have a, a, a live furniture maker on view at all times. So I think, right. yeah, we've kind of expanded that into a virtual realm. Right. Yeah. I mean, maybe we could hire a live furniture maker to be there a There we go. <laughs> Hologram. Um, no right. furniture maker. <laughs> no. No, no furniture no. maker in his natural habitat. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, Starting with the workbench and then we'll add right. it. Yeah. Uh, Caitlin, other questions? Um, yes. Uh, one person is interested if you know of any Newport made furniture in the White House collection. There is at least one piece. I can't uh, say a whole lot more um, because I only know it's there because I saw it in, on TV during yeah. a White House event and said, oh my God, that's Newport furniture. So I, I, I believe that we could probably do some Googling and turn it up. But yeah, there, there is new furniture in the White House. I think if you check the, the Rhode Island Furniture Archive, which um, Pat talked about at the beginning sure. of this, and probably. I'm pretty sure there's some of this, that it, there are a few, there's like a, there's a Goddard, um, I think it's a high chest. Yep. I might be wrong. Right. But. And of course, our colleague at the Preservation Society, Leslie Jones, yeah. came from the, um, I always forget the name of that organization. It's not the White House itself. It's a historical association for the White right. House or something yeah. like that. Something there's a few, thing, yeah. and I'm sorry, right. I th my internet just cut out, but I, I think Gina said there's some at the State Department yeah. as well. Definitely. Oh, for the sure State there's Department. a clock, yeah. clock at the State yeah. Department. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Caitlin, other questions? Um, yes. One person is asking um, Larry, Larry's asking a clarifying question um, about, they say, what is the Newport shell that Ruth mentioned? Not sure what that's referring to. I don't know if you remember Ruth. The block and shell. Um, I don't think it was me who mentioned it, but I'm sure we were referring to the decorative shell that appears on Newport furniture. Yeah. Do we have a, I don't know if we have a picture. Um, well, I mean, we actually to... do in the, even here in the, I mean, in terms of the one. shell itself, even here in the high boy room, there is um, just a shell, but I can go to others. Yeah. Yeah, the high boys like there's, have there's a There's a very like good that. block yeah. and shell. Right there. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's kind of a distinctive Newport Feature. motif. Right. Which, yeah, because uh, the shell is not unique to Newport, but it's the particular block, block front. It's got okay. the concave, convex concave. Okay. Um, Caitlin, other questions? Um, 
Yes. Um, another question. Uh, do we know if the population demographics of Newport in the 18th century reflect those of the 21st century? I don't think so. I think there we sorry, go ahead, Ruth. <laughs> I think the answer is yes and no. Um, yeah. I, I think it's hard to make direct comparisons, but um, and, and in some cases, it's just a flat no. I mean, Newport has a pretty substantial Central American population mm -hmm. now. I'm pretty sure that was limited, if at all, in the 18th mm -hmm. century. Um, but Newport was extraordinarily diverse in the 18th century right. in its way for its time. So there's a degree to which that question is sort of, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a port city. And so port right. city, you know, One even then, the, I mean, the question is, on what day, right? So, <laughs> right. depending on what ship was in the port at what time, and um, well, and given that um, how much traffic there was between the mahogany um, plantations and yeah. Newport, maybe even um, maybe not so much Central American, but South American uh, folks were here. I we have a couple of researchers who are always asking us to keep our eyes out for evidence of Muslims in Newport in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, and I, I have not found that in our collection yet, but we are always looking. Mm. Interesting. We've got to figure a sailor or two, but sure. whether, it, sure. whether it was noted. Right. Hmm. Right. Uh, Caitlin, do we have any more questions? Um, yes, there, there's, um, there's another question about um, wondering if there's been any work done on the relationship between 18th century cabinet makers and architects. <laughs> yeah, I typed an answer for that, and, and the only, I, you know, the, the easy thing for me to say off the top of my head is that um, there's a lot of good evidence that some of the furniture makers were also housewrights, yeah. and they certainly did the interiors, and they probably did some exterior um, uh, features on the houses as well, and there was definitely a relationship between, I mean, there were no real architects in the early 18th century, you have, um, uh, Richard Monday, you know, sort of proto-architect, and then you have Peter Harrison, but the builders um, definitely made use of the Newport furniture makers. In fact, Christopher Townsend yeah. probably did some of the really notable interiors of Newport's um, 1730s and 1740s buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, um, I think we'll take one more question. Yeah, that's perfect, because we have one final question. <laughs> yeah, look at that. <laughs> Um, and so this one, um, they're, they're basically just interested. They have never um, had the opportunity to visit Whitehorn House Museum. Um, and we're wondering if we might be able to cycle through some of the images that we have in this PowerPoint. Well, I mean, ideally you should come to the Whitehorn House Museum because I'm, I'm delighted to say that we are opening tomorrow, uh, July 18th. We open back up to the public, um, which is really an extraordinary accomplishment thanks uh, to several of the people uh, um, on this call actually but sure we can uh let's take a step or yeah. two back yes okay yeah. so this uh, this is right. the old before view, um of how we sort of had period rooms mm -hmm. and then this is something that's in our upstairs there are three high boys um and one of them is a loan object from a family uh, another was in our collection and the one on the far right is by benjamin baker um, and so in this room, we're really trying to educate folks um, about looking. And so three things that are pretty much identical, but have very different details. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's been very actually successful because people appreciate sort of being where to point it to look. Um, you know, the right. finials, the open tops, different legs. Yeah, because what you don't see in that picture is that, um, I guess, to the viewer's left is like Kristen's describing, there's a little handy diagram that points out all the different um, technical right. features of the piece so you can... Are you seeing a new one? Yep. Mm -hmm. so okay. Installation today. Okay. Uh, so, right. so we're looking at the sand for tea table. On uh, the right. Um, and then yep. this is the dining room table with um, a uh, another lone sideboard. It's a Townsend sideboard. Our Townsend dining mm -hmm. table pulled apart. And this is also just to show sort of, again, elevating the objects to look at them as objects um, as opposed to, you know, period rooms. Right. And the sand for tea table um, was a recent acquisition by NRF, and one of the exciting things about that is that we have uh, his chalk signature on the bottom of that table, which 
was, which was uh, quite a find. Um, I, I'm just going to observe that this table with the um, with the triangular drawers. Um, a lot of furniture makers have reached out to us about it. Uh, last year, I got I said several emails from people saying, "Do you have?" plans? Do you have something I could use to sort of figure out how to make this myself? <laughs> um, and then the, to the right is, the, is, yeah, yeah, it is extraordinary, is the and Daniel the Spencer that, piece. Go ahead. Yeah, and I point out about the Daniel Spencer pieces. Um, so a lot of the things that it's kind of exciting about Whitehorn is, and, and Newport furniture in general is people think, well, that's it, you know everything there is to know. This is an example of a piece that Doris Duke purchased thinking it was made in, uh, made in Rhode Island, made in Newport. Further scholarship after her death revealed it was probably Rhode Island, most likely Providence. And since then, um, with the work of Pat Kane at Yale um, and a few others, it's we've now attributed it positively to Daniel Spencer, who is a Providence who trained in Newport. So right. just an example that this is not a um, sort of stagnant area of study. This is another John Townsend piece on our upstairs. Um, and this year, if you come to Whitehorn, you'll see it, um, this bed, sort of just as it is, um, which is great to you know, have to see some of the ugly 1970s upholstery that mm -hmm. um, we have been slowly re reproducing and redoing in the house. Um, and again, yeah, an example of an, another space that we're trying to sort of reinvigorate. It's in this, in it's, sorry, the installation for this is really cool now too, because we have the uh, Townsend side chair right next to it, so you can really look at the, the feet compare the feet right next to each other just right. and they were probably they were we think they were from the same collection that he um, passed on to his daughter and then they stayed in through the family until um, Doris Duke eventually acquired them so it's a really neat story and then here's an example of our many chairs as I uh, think <laughs> Gina mentioned we have just a house full of chairs uh, so on the left is our Townsend chair that Gina was just mentioning in the middle is a, a Windsor chair with some really interesting green paint and on the far yeah. right is a really interesting chair um, from Made in Little Compton. The earliest piece in the house is from the 17th century and um, the original corn has to be likely made um, right yep. in Little Compton. And the piece that we shared with uh, the Newport Historical Society for um, mm -hmm. That's right. a show this winter. Um, this uh, again is another example of, of scholarship. This is uh, two pieces that would look like they are not made by the same person or even from the same time period. Um, but there is this curious case of a similar mark, which I think might be the left next slide, possibly. Yes. No. Oh. No. I think I. Oh, nope. I'm sorry. No marks. No well, marks. Well, those two pieces Damn. have a um, a very similar marking. Who uh, two researchers are kind of going back and forth about we're calling him Joiner D. It could be a crescent moon, it could be a D, um, but they share very similar um, attributions in terms of their make. And um, it's an interesting idea that the, we have this mystery maker who made these two uh, really amazing pieces that, as you look, you know, the one on the right looks like it comes from, you know, a shaker or something because of weird bun feet, um, mm. but they're both um, very Newport. And last but not least. Oh, this is our touch um, uh, that I mentioned earlier that we have these two um, legs that Jeffrey Green made for us so people can see the process of carving. Um, and then right next to it is a piece of mahogany that he has um, shown on all four sides, this sort of levels of finish and, and feel. Um, it's amazing how many people don't know what a real piece of wood furniture feels like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, because that's such a big part of the story of mahogany too is its density, which you can't right. you can say it's dense, but to able to be able to pick it up is, is absolutely a whole other thing. It, it really is extraordinary. Um, I think that's going to conclude this evening. Um, for those of you, uh, for the visitors that are still here, um, I really wanted to um, how much I appreciate your attendance and enthusiasm. I've gotten a bunch of emails each session um, with not only compliments, but sometimes suggestions and other thoughts. Um, this will be made, all of these programs will be made available on YouTube once we are able to, um, once we're able to edit them um, into a presentation. I, the, the files we're getting from Zoom are these three or four very, very weird files that have to be edited together. And then we will put them up on YouTube. Um, and we will certainly be continuing these kinds of discussions in the future. Um, 
I just have to say what a pleasure it was to speak to, uh, to all of you. Uh, this is, as I said, it was a really special night because I got to talk to some of my favorite people um, in the world, the people I work with every day, and Ruth, who up until it was no longer safe to do so, we used to have lunch with every month, and um, I hope we get to do that again. And I hope that I see all of you uh, at the Whitehorn House this summer sometime. We're open to the public. Uh, we would really love to see you there. And thanks, everybody, for being part of this discussion. Um, an extra special thanks to Caitlin Seller, who has given up every night this week um, to, uh, to be stuck here with, with me. Um, but in fairness, you got to listen to some very entertaining people as well. And um, we will see you again soon. Thanks, everybody, for being part of this. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Eric. Yep. Thanks.